Welcome to Jack's Conversations. It's my pleasure to have this week uh, Jack's Conversations with Professor Karen Woolley of uh, Texas A&M University. Uh, she's a distinguished professor uh, and goes by numerous titles that recognize her high impact and influence in the discipline. She's a President Impact Fellow. Uh, she holds the Doherty Welch Foundation Chair, uh, Professor of Chemical Engineering, Material Science and Material Science Engineering, Director um, at Texas A&M University of the Laboratory for Synthetic Biology Interactions. She's a research superiority researcher, member of the National Academy of Sciences, fellow of the American Institute for Medical and Biological Engineering, fellow of the National Academy of Inventors, fellow of the Royal Society, the list goes on and on. Huh? In fact, recipient of numerous awards, but instead of going through them, I'd rather leave time to um, hear uh, what Professor Karen Woolley has to say about a number of important topics. So welcome, Karen. I'm curious if you could share with us what your vision for, for chemistry and, and perhaps your specific field um, is as it moves into the 21st century. Well, thank you so much, Eric. And, and I have to say, it's my pleasure to be speaking with you today. I think this is a really important activity that you're doing, getting the word out, getting, giving us a chance to have um, conversations with the community. Um, so it's, it's my pleasure to be here. And I think um, one of the things that I've always found fascinating about chemistry is that we don't just study matter at the molecular level, but we can man manipulate it. And that manipulation process is really important because we can create new matter. And my field is synthetic organic chemistry, but applied toward macromolecules or polymers. Often people think of those as being plastics and being simple materials, but in fact, they're highly sophisticated. And so in my field, what is what we're moving forward with are the creation of new materials that can impact society in positive ways. But what we have to do is have the vision to not only make functional materials that people want to have, say, in their cell phones or in their everyday lives, but also construct those in such a way as we're responsible about how we make them, how how we consider their life cycle, how we consider how long they're going to exist relative to what application they're being used for. And I think that's something that chemists are doing more and more is they're, they're thinking about the responsible aspects of what it is we're synthesizing and, and what the ultimate degradation of that material might be. I feel sometimes we have, a dif we have difficulties in communicating to the public the relevance and importance uh, of chemistry. Um, do you have uh, insight as to why that might be? I mean, it's such a central science. You're right. I mean, chemistry is the central science and it's something that's so critical that the scientists need to, I think, improve how we discuss um, what we do with, with the public. The public has to know that. And, and now that, uh, you know, we've gone through this COVID pandemic, science is becoming much more at the forefront and scientists it's, it's, it's a critical time for us. We, we, need, we need to be speaking to the public about what it is we do, why we do it, why it's important, and, and how it can impact their lives. Um, it strikes me with all the various uh, leadership roles you have in synthetic biology, uh, material science, chemical engineering, you must encounter probably similar problems involving communication between scientists, that we don't all speak the same language. How do you, how do you manage to get all these people together and, and agree on a common goal? I think that it, it used to be more of a problem. Um, you know, there's been uh, this this growth toward more and more collaboration uh, across different disciplines over the last couple of decades, and so the terminology is is something that you know we're we're each learning our our different vocabularies and we're able to communicate to a greater extent. But yeah, definitely, people who are coming into uh, a new field. Um, often feel excluded uh, and yet they they usually have the best perspectives and and this outward looking inward facing kind of new ideas to bring to a different discipline what uh, advice would you give um the up and coming generation of uh, researchers i guess in particular um chemists as they start to chart their own independent career and attempt to be as successful as you have been there are lots of pieces of advice. In fact, I, I often give an hour long lecture to uh, junior faculty and, and young people you starting out. Good afternoon, Karen. <laughs> I don't know if everyone wants to listen to, to all of it, but I think one uh, key message I would say is be genuine, follow your passion. Um, you know, 
don't do something just because you think it's going to be attractive or important. You really have to be um, absolutely committed to to whatever whatever it is you pursue it, through your teaching, your research, your, your service. And that commitment means that you do everything at the highest level of quality. Don't do anything halfway. You've got to, if you, if you commit to something, you've really got to take it all the way uh, through. You're very broad in terms of your interest and your knowledge of the molecular sciences. Um, what do you think are the big questions uh, chemists should be asking and addressing, the ones that can have a big impact on society and well into the future? What, what would be some of those questions? So one of the things that, that I really appreciate is um, the funding agencies in the U.S. Because the program officers at these funding agencies spend a lot of time thinking about how the society's money should be invested uh, in, in studying science. And for instance, the National Science Foundation here in the U.S. has put together a series of, of big ideas that, that, that scientists should be pursuing. And I think everyone should take a look at those because they're, they're, they're thoughtful and they're important, but of course they're, that, they're not everything, right? So I think that what we need to be doing every day is looking to, to our world and see, you know, what, how can we have impact? So in my own research, for instance, um, we have developed some nanoparticles that are hybrid of polymer particles and magnetically responsive iron act iron oxide nanoparticles, and these can be deployed to capture crude oil and recover it. And that's a project we started when the Deepwater Horizon oil spill occurred in the Gulf of Mexico in 2010. More recently, just in the last couple of years, we've been working on super absorbent hydrogel materials that are derived from sugars so that they can solidify or gel water to prevent flooding and then release that water and break down and re release the sugars as well to grow plants uh, later to mediate the effects of drought. And that happened because I was fighting Hurricane Harvey out here uh, trying to flood my, my home. And so I think that that's one of the really beautiful things about being a chemist is that we can see there's a need and then we can do something about it. And I think if we're just attentive to those things every day, then, then we're going to be pushing the science forward. So one of the things I think we scientists uh, should be doing better is uh, at being more inclusive and more diverse um, in the makeup of our, of our field, diversity broadly defined. Um, I wonder if you could share with us your views on how we can sort of meet those kinds of objectives. And, and create a better environment um, for science to prosper in. That's that's uh, that's something that I'm 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 absolutely passionate about, and I I don't have good answers. Um, in addition to all the other titles you mentioned, I have recently served on a very important commission here at Texas A&M University, the Commission on Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, and we basically did a fact finding um, mission to to try to identify where there are problems in, in not being inclusive and, and how can we address those. Um, we're working toward those, but I think that that it's it's something that, that we absolutely must pay a lot of attention to and 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 soon. Um, thankfully in the polymer chemistry community, it's really a community. It's a community spirit and, and it's a welcoming group of people. So anyone who's listening to this who might be interested in polymer chemistry, I say, come on over. We, we welcome everyone. It's a, it's a fantastic, it's like a family network atmosphere. And um, we bring especially junior people into the fold. We're not exclusive at all. And, and um, I think that chemists in general um, in the past would be more competitive with each other. Whereas we've recognized more recently that working together and including everyone means that, that the whole field can move forward. What do you think has been critical to your, to your success, to your meteoric rise um, and uh, recognition as, uh, uh, as a leading researcher um, in chemistry? That's a tough question. Um, I, I can just say that I work very hard. Um, and I always try to operate at the highest level of rigor and quality. And um, I've had a lot of great support over the years, um, some fantastic mentors. And, you know, you, you build a network. Um, 
I, I remember a quote from back when I was a PhD student. One of my uh, colleagues used to like to say, no one is an island. And it's really true. Um, we, we have to be able to work together. We have to have a network. We, 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 that's just the way that, that science operates. No, nobody can do it alone. So, so you just have to have a good team. I wonder if I could follow up on that. Uh, who were your mentors? Who were your heroes? And um, how were they critical um, to, your, to your career? So I would say that my most primary mentor was Jean Frechet. And Jean was someone, I mean, he was my PhD advisor, of course, and, and a PhD advisor is, is critical to any student. I mean, I think young people need to know that that deciding who to work with for, for PhD dissertation research is the, is the most important decision I think anyone will ever make. And um, so I was really lucky to have Jean Frechet as my, as my PhD advisor. And he, he pushed me in ways that, that I didn't even think I could imagine would be possible. So for instance, um, I had my first son when I was a second year PhD student. And so he, he managed to arrange it so that I could do a double TA one semester so that I wouldn't have to TA the next semester. So I could really, again, get in there and work hard uh, one semester and then, and then deal with my, my personal things. But then when I was finishing up my PhD, uh, I always thought I was going to go into an industrial position, and and he just he just said, why don't you write some proposals and apply for academic jobs? And and I didn't think it was possible, you know. I mean, without a postdoc, but I mean, I already had a son. I didn't want to go do a postdoc and disrupt his life, and then and then and then move on with my career. And so I jumped right in, and and you know, it was it was it was possible. I went straight into a faculty position at Washington University in St. Louis. And so what that meant was that I didn't have a postdoctoral advisor, so I didn't have that other mentor. So the people who stepped into that role were Bob Grubbs and Dave Terrell, and and they really um, helped me out, you know, a lot. They they um, provided great advice. They they wrote letters uh, for me for you know awards and things, um, and, and they they took on that that mentor uh, role. And I was lucky that the faculty at Washington University in St. Louis was pretty small um, in the Department of Chemistry. And I had some fantastic colleagues and, and then they took on mentor roles. And you know, they would say just small things to me that it would be meaningful. I, remember, I still remember Peter Gaspar reading one of my first manuscripts and, and saying to me um, that, you know, it's not about the stability of my polymers, it was about the instability, you know, and something as simple as that, when I was working on rapidly degradable polymers, I started thinking about the instability as opposed to the stability. And, and it just, you know, turned around my perspective. And so there are just, you know, there are many, many of those kinds of examples. Um, uh, again, it, it, it takes a team, it takes a network, and it, it means that people need to listen to each other. and take the advice yeah. and, and consider it. Well, I can confirm that Bob and uh, Dave were talking a lot about you. I remember knowing of you um, when I was at Caltech um, as an assistant professor many years ago, I had heard your name and um, all the wonderful things that you were doing um, in polymer science. So um, thank you. you were already thank talking you. about uh, in that era. Um, so we've talked about things that you would advise the next generation to focus on. Um, what would you advise them to stay away from, to avoid? Uh, what kind of career pitfalls um, to, to, to just uh, don't, you know, not to go there? Yeah, so, so I, I, again, it's, it, I wouldn't say there are any pitfalls, pitfalls in any kind of particular research they would want to do. Um, I think they do need to have a good balance of, of really creative, innovative, high impact kind of projects. And then a, a few other things that are going to be like, almost guaranteed to work so that there's always something that's that, that's moving forward. But I think the biggest pitfall I would say would be in the way they operate and, and the way they interact with others. I would say never be superficial. Again, it comes back to the point of you always have to be genuine. You always have to be, um, again, doing your best, absolutely your best all the time. Well, you kind of said one earlier that I completely subscribe to, and that is avoid fads, right? It's all too easy. Uh, to, to to fall into that trap, um, and and then you're never the leader necessarily when you're following a fad. Uh, some people do become leaders uh, eventually in a fad, but it's so easy to sort of remain in a secondary position because you're following someone else's lead. No? Exactly, exactly. Mm -hmm. And I think the other key point is 
you have to be willing to always innovate, right? I mean, the fact that, that you know, we take on projects as, as you know, the Deepwater Horizon oil spill occurred and, and the Hurricane Harvey happened, you know, you, you've got to be able to adjust. You've got to always be um, diversifying your, your, your interests, diversifying your research activities and, and moving things along. Don't stagnate. What do you think JAX has done well in the past? Um... And of course, that's going to be followed up with a question of what do you think could be done better um, as we move into this new era? So I think that the JAX has captured some of the best chemistry. They've captured some of the most innovative work and the most high quality, high impact. And I think in the future, what I would like to see JAX doing is more uh, steering the future directions of, of where chemistry should be going. And I think this can be done in, in, in many ways, um, but one very simple uh, way would be to reintroduce things like letters to the editor and, and have provocative editorials written that, that don't just look backward like a review would, uh, but rather look to the future and really point to where, um, you know, resources should be directed, where where people should be thinking about where they can have impact. Do you have a favorite Jacks of yours that um, you would tell your students, you know, to read or to, uh, this is this is my favorite. I have several favorite Jacks. The 1996 one on making shell cross-link kind of like nanoparticles. One other one that's my one of my favorites is that we then took that kind of a particle and we degraded the core and carved it out and it expanded into a nano cage like structure. And there's a few reasons why I really like this nano cage communication in Jack. Tom Maluk was the associate editor who handled it and he gave us some fantastic advice. Um, we, when we carved out the core, there was an expansion of, of the dimension, the diameter of the, of the structure to such an extent that he pointed out that it would either be highly porous or like super, super thin, right? And, and, and we hadn't been thinking about that, that, you know, how much material did we have to begin with? How did we spread it over this larger dimensionality and things? So he gave us some really key insights. So, Karen, we've reached the end of our allotted time uh, for the interview. Do you have any last words, uh, any um, words of wisdom you would like to share with us uh, before we draw this to a close? The only thing I'd like to say is thank you so much for taking on this role. Um, Peter Stang was a fantastic editor in chief, and I appreciate everything that he did for Jax. And I see that you're going to lead us into the next couple decades. So thank you for, for undertaking this, this important task. Thanks, Karen, and I look forward to doing that with you. 